angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy, eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. The non-canonical extra-biblical book of Enoch tells us that there were watchers, supernatural beings called the sons of God who came down on Mount Hermon, intermarried with humans, taught humanity things we should not know. That sin shows up in the New Testament. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert, alongside my wife, best friend, the host of Skywatch Women, Sharon Gilbert. Hey, sweetie. And the author of a forthcoming book that deals with the sin of the watchers and its importance for New Testament theology. He's the scholar in residence for Logos Bible Software, working title of the book, Reversing Hermon, The Importance of the Sin of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch for New Testament Theology, the subtitle, Dr. Michael Heiser. Mike, welcome back. Thank you. Um, for those of us who were raised in church every Sunday morning, um, you know, Sunday school, since I can remember all the way through college, at which time I kind of fell away. Um, Mount Herman, never mentioned. <laughs> Watchers, never Gee, mentioned. it was in my church. It, yes. <laughs> even, even though, there. <laughs> yeah, even though, even though, you know, the Watchers are mentioned in the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, never heard that term, never heard any of this stuff. Um, where do we find the sin of the Watchers? And, and maybe as a, a review, what is the sin of the Watchers? And then how does that affect and influence New Testament theology? Sure. Yeah, the sin of the Watchers, again, the, the sort of the quick version of it is not only the transgression, you know, transgressing heaven and earth, this boundary that the first estate, you know, to use Peter and Jude language, that's what people typically think of. But it's, it's actually more than that. It's a part of that, you know, era that's presented in, in this book involved the watchers teaching people, you know, for lack of a better term, forbidden arts, forbidden knowledge, things that, that corrupted humanity, warfare, mm -hmm. okay, arts of seduction, you know, just things like this. And so in, in, in the Jewish mind, again, in the intertestamental period, which is where we get in the book we know as Enoch and other books that are Enochian, as scholars like to refer to them, this notion of what the watchers did in terms of their teaching, their corruption, is what becomes the central focus for the proliferation of evil. Remember Genesis 6, 5, okay, right after the, you know, the whole Sons of God episode, right. that describes just the all-encompassing wickedness, okay, of, of humanity. Well, you ask, well, how did they be get, get that wicked? Because you kind of go from the Genesis 6 stuff and the, you know, the Sons of God, the Nephilim and all that, and then you get to this statement about wickedness. Again, that question is answered in both the New Testament and, of course, in the intertestamental period. Because if you asked a Jew, again, to, to explain his hamartiology, okay, his doctrine of sin, you know, why is the world the way it is and why, why, why do we have depravity? Their answer is not just ex, or Genesis 3, the fall, which is what our reflexive mm -hmm. response would be. Their answer is, well, the watchers, Genesis 6. Okay, what they taught people corrupted them, and, and it just spread like wildfire or wildfire through humanity. And so that is the thing that in the Jewish mind, that's the human problem. We are doomed you know, to an eternity without God because we, we, we won't be resurrected unless, again, we're redeemed. Okay, because of what happens in Genesis 3, you know, we're sort of owned by the Lord of the dead, you know, the Satan figure and all this kind of stuff. It's very familiar in Christian theology. But not only that, not only does that need to be dealt with and reversed, but depravity needs to be dealt with and reversed. Hmm. And so for the, for the Jew, when they thought about Messiah, when they thought about what the Messiah was supposed to do, it wasn't just resurrection, cure my, cure my death problem. It was cure my depravity problem, fix the world. Hey, while you're at it, you know, while you're rising, rising from the dead, why don't you fix the world too? And so this, they had the whole complex of ideas in view, and it's because of the Watcher incident. Hmm. Hmm. So this is more than just a complicating the, the matter from the fall, mm -hmm. from Genesis 3. Uh, 
it, it, we, we've begun to sin humanity mm -hmm. because of the uh, Adam and Eve were lured into the, the lie of right. the, the Nakash into they believing were they could be capable, as gods. Right, they were capable of sinning because they do, again, in the biblical story, but they become better at it. They become more inclined to it. They, they, they discover new ways, you know, to, to serve themselves, mm -hmm. okay, hmm. because of, of, you know, what the more watchers do. More secret knowledge stuff. Yeah, so, so again, this is part of, again, the, the Jewish view of, of why the world is the way it is. Now, I'll, I'll give you a few hints, you know, without, you know, too many spoilers here for the book. No, but, we want spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm going to say, and what I write in the book, and I tell people in the book, look, a lot of this is going to be really unfamiliar to you. For, for the academic, again, for the biblical scholar, scholars write about this stuff all the time. I mean, there, there are just mounds and mounds and mounds of journal articles. You know, scholars typically just write for themselves about Enoch and Enochian story and the sin of the watchers in the New Testament. This is, this is a, a kind of a snoozer, okay? It's, it's old stuff. But nobody's ever collected it and put it into a book form and tried to make it decipherable again to the normal person, you know, the person who's just interested in Bible study. Mm -hmm. So for example, you get the birth of the Messiah. Now this ties in again with, if, if you actually take Revelation 12, okay, as the, an, an example of the ancient genre of astral prophecy, that what John sees in the sky, he actually means when he says, I see these things in the sky, you know, and they portend the birth of the Messiah. Again, you, and people beside me have done this. They've plotted this out in astronomy programs, and it produces a date, you know, for the birth of, of the Messiah, September, mm -hmm. you know, 11th, 3 B.C. Mm -hmm. Which is that. creepy in and of yes, itself, it September 11th, itself, yeah. Right. But that correlates with Tishri 1. Okay? Mm -hmm. It was the same day in the Jewish calendar. Tishri 1 is the inauguration of the Jewish king, you know, in, in Israelite times and all this ah. stuff. But there's like more, the same as Rosh Hashanah? Yes. There, there, there's more to it than that because... In Jewish tradition, and again, the book deals with why Jews thought this, and it's based on flood chronology. There we are back now to the Genesis 6, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. In their view, Noah was also born on Tishri 1. And so the Messiah and uh, Noah would have shared yes. a birthday. And, and Noah is the key figure because he survives the flood, and he survives the flood. And what, what event corresponds to that? The destruction of the giants and the, the punishment of the watchers. And so the Jews were expecting the Messiah they, they looked at Noah as being a type of the Messiah for this reason. Mm -hmm. And so the birth of the Messiah, again, was viewed as this event that will fix the problem, not just the Genesis 3 problem, but the Genesis 6 problem. And there are other astronomical things that associate it with the Pleiades and the constellation Orion, who's the giant, and mm -hmm. you know, there are Dead Sea Scroll references to you know, the Nafilah, the giant Orion, that are connect back to this. Again, the book deals with this kind of thing, getting you into the, the Jewish mindset. The genealogy of Jesus is another one. Why are, there, why are these particular four women in the genealogy? You know, the, the, the pat answer is, oh, they must be all Gentiles, and that's there to show us that God likes Gentiles too. Well, you know, like the rest of your Old Testament says that too, so that's not really profound. Mm -hmm. But again, based on work that nobody else is going to have read because it's, it's a dissertation you know, of a few years ago, a uh, dissertation by someone named Amy Richter uh, at Marquette, went through the genealogies and made this, this case. And she makes a really compelling case, and I use this for the book in one chapter, that all four of these women, if you go back again in the primary text and look at, again, the original Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic words, the circumstances of their life, what happens to them, or, or how they respond to what happens to them, borrows vocabulary from Genesis 6, 1 through 4, hmm. and the Enochian story of the Watchers. Are you talking about Ruth and Rahab? Yeah, and Tamar and Bathsheba yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and her thesis is that a, a lot of these episodes, again, revolve around illicit sexual relationships or, again, some point of you know, heaven and earth kind of transgression, like Tamar, the, the Kedeshah, the, you know, mm -hmm. the cult prostitute, you know, right. heaven and earth relationship there. But they're, they're, the references are kind of cryptic, unless you're an Israelite, okay, or unless you're a first century Jew, you can kind of pick up on these, these little breadcrumbs that are laid in the text. We miss them all in English. But her, her thesis is that th these women were chosen specifically because the one produced by this genealogy, Jesus of Nazareth, is the one who will reverse all these things. He hmm. will take care of the sin problem and reverse, again, the proliferation of evil in the culture. Oh, that's wonderful. Hmm. So it, you, you have a lot of, again, cryptic stuff that, you know, scholars talk about this stuff all the time. When, 
th this is kind of, this book's kind of going to be kind of like Unseen Realm, where what I tried to do in the Unseen Realm was to take material that scholars talk about, you know, just you know on a, on a regular basis, that never really filters down into the church. And to take that material and, again, make it decipherable so that people can see, okay, well, this is why Peter and, and Jude would, would even be thinking about Enoch or even bother to read the story, because elements of it just, you know, are, are breadcrumbed through the text in various ways because it, it's part of their worldview, and the, and the Messiah needs to deal with this problem. Hmm. Now, Galatians 3.19, the law was added because of transgressions. Everyone assumes those transgressions are, are Adam and Eve. Right, date back to the garden. Right. Yeah. Again, another you know, paper I, I went to hear at an academic conference, and I, I got the paper afterwards because I was so impressed by it. But a guy you know, went through second, all the Second Temple Jewish literature and asked this question. Could it be that the law, the idea of the law being added to transgressions, that the transgressions that we're talking about there are the transgressions of the watchers? Did any Jews ever think that? about hmm. the law? And hmm. the answer is, oh yeah. Oh yeah, they did. Hmm. And so he, he, he takes you through all the material, and I'm gonna condense it for the, the sake of the, the chapter of the book. But his, his thesis was, okay, now if we read Galatians 3 and 4, there's some historic academic problems about what Paul says about the law in this chapter. If we view it through this lens, does it make any better sense? Okay. Hmm. <laughs> but again, why was the law added? To, to halt the proliferation of evil. And it's not just a Jewish thing. It, it's, you know, for the nations and all this kind of stuff. So th these are just examples of, of mm -hmm. chapters. There are 12 or 13 chapters in the book. It, it, the Watcher, Sin of the Watchers relates to baptism, how cri early Christians used to practice baptism with denunciations of the devil and his angels. And then there's a reason for that. Kind of an exorcistic. Yeah, yeah. there's a reason why you would connect baptism mm -hmm. in, in 1 Peter 3. Why does Peter connect Noah, the flood, baptism, the spirits that are in prison, i.e. the Watchers? Why does he connect all these ideas? Yeah. Well, there are answers for that because he has Enoch in his head. And he has the sin of the watchers in his head. And baptism makes a statement about that because it unites you to Christ, mm -hmm. who's the Messiah, who's going to reverse all this garbage. So there's a lot of things going on like that in the New Testament mm. that we just, we never really think about that the writer was trying to communicate to us. But the, the, you know, the reality is the Bible might have been written for us, but it wasn't written to us. So we are outsiders. We are cultural outsiders to a lot of what, the writer's dropping in there that he assumes his immediate audience will just, you know, click mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. But we're 2,000 years removed from that. It's not, it's not clicking with us because we're so far removed from the original context. We don't read things like, like the Book of Enoch. We mm -hmm. don't have that in our head. We'll never see it unless somebody sort of says, you know, read the book and then look at this, you know. And that's what I'm trying to do. When Paul was writing with this context in mind, with the idea that the watchers, that whole, that Jesus Christ the Messiah would and did re reverse it and eventually will mm -hmm. judge all of the angels. It's the already but not yet. The judgment has begun yet. and is proceeding as planned. When he writes about women keeping their heads covered, do you think <laughs> he, do you think, because the watchers, because yeah, the yep, angels watch, because of the angels, do you yeah. think that he thought that that sin was still a, at risk? That yeah. the watchers still might come in. Yeah, and do I, I that? may have to put a disclaimer on that <laughs> chapter. Uh, for, for those people who who might be watching this and and have heard my uh, episode on this on the have Naked Bible podcast, room, yeah, yeah, have the children <laughs> leave the room. Uh, the the language in First Corinthians eleven about the head covering uh, comes out of Greco-Roman medical texts. Uh, believe it or not. And it's very sexual in nature. Now, mm -hmm. you know, the, the broad point is, is modesty. And you can kind of tell that, you know, just reading it mm -hmm. even in English. But because of the terminology that's used and the strong sexual component of the head covering itself. It's more than a scarf. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the hair and the whole bit. I mean, basically, they, they thought that the length of a woman's hair had something to do with fertility and fecundity. Hmm. Again, this is just oh. Greco, yeah, it's Greco-Roman Gentile science. He's writing to Gentiles, you know, so that he's he's connecting with them. But you know, now, in addition to the modesty point, he's concerned that they be sexually faithful to their husbands uh, and their wives, and 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 again, just modest in in what they do with their hair or not, and all that sort of thing. And he adds because of the angels. 
So in Paul's mind, it's not a statement that what happened in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 recurred, but it, it, evidently in Paul's mind, that was a possibility that he wanted to just cut off, you know, at, right, right there. We, mm -hmm. we don't want this kind of thing to happen again because of, of what resulted from it. We're still living with the results of this. So you could just tell this is part of Paul's consciousness. He's, he's concerned about this possibility when he throws that in, in that chapter. Hmm. Well, the working title of Dr. Heiser's book, Reversing Herman, discusses the influence of the story recorded in the book of Enoch, the, the sin of the watchers and its influence on uh, New Testament theology. We'll talk more about intertestamental period literature and how much influence it has on the writers of the uh, Gospels and also what it means to reverse the sin of the watchers when Skywatch TV continues right after this. Finally, a book that helps you make sense of the hard to understand parts of the Bible. Skywatch TV is proud to offer The Unseen Realm by ancient language and Bible scholar, Dr. Michael S. Heiser. He takes you into the world of the men who wrote the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And by understanding their worldview, you will better understand some of the weird parts of the Bible. Like why was it so important to mention giants in the Old Testament? And why did Peter and Jude reference the angels who created them in the New Testament? The supernatural war between God and the fallen angels is real. The unseen realm helps you understand the way the apostles and prophets saw that war. And when you order the unseen realm from Skywatch TV, we will add these two books free. The Supernatural Worldview by Chris Putnam and G.H. Pember's classic, Earth's Earliest Ages. Order the unseen realm now by calling the number on your screen or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Welcome back to Skywatch TV, I'm Derek Gilbert. Alongside Sharon Gilbert and Dr. Michael Heiser, we discuss the forthcoming book tentatively titled Reversing Herman. Uh, please log on to skywatchtv.com. We have content there exclusive to the website. Our web-only content includes interviews that we couldn't fit into the network television schedule and uh, programs exclusively for our viewers online. The Skywatch TV channel on Roku and YouTube, such as... Skywatch Women, hosted mm -hmm. by Sharon Gilbert. Our weekly look at science, Sci Friday, and uh, Josh Peck as he uh, deconstructs the universe one particle at a time into the multiverse. Josh Peck co-hosted with his wife, Christina Peck. That and more, our daily news updates as well, all at skywatchtv.com. Um, Mike, what does it mean to reverse the sin of the watchers? Yeah, it, it means redemption. It means reclaiming you know, what Eden was originally supposed to be, what, what life on earth for humans was supposed to be. In communion with God, again, just think of the original idea, the original enterprise of Eden, if you will, that God comes to humanity, wants to live with humanity, live with his human family, uh, and of course have his divine family, you know, a blended family, all at one. Heaven meets earth. This is what Eden is. It gets marred and ruined, again, by the events of Genesis 3. And then you have, again, other divine beings who also rebel and want to, again, come down to earth. And the Enochian literature has a variety of motives for this, depending on which text you read. But they come down to earth, and the result of what they do is to further destroy, further undermine God's you know, plan to bring humanity back into a relationship with him. So they, their humanity is essentially propelled away from a relationship with God. Again, seeking their own pleasure, seeking the, you know, to, to kill off each other and, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So reversing it is not just, again, oh, God looks at you and you're righteous now because you've accepted the Messiah and, and that, not, and, you know, that you know, whole complex of ideas. But it's also that we need this taken care of. We need you to have a renewed nature. The spirit of God needs to reside in you to progressively, again, here's the imaging language that you get in Genesis one, okay? But now you are to be made like the image of his son who is the perfect image, okay? The, the perfect manifestation of, of the kind of imaging that God wanted for all people. And of course, you know, you work toward glorification, you know, doing that, going back to the global Eden. But the, the linchpin for all of it is the Messiah. And so he becomes the central figure in this, in this sort of stopgap, stopping point thing that we have to reinstall, again, the kingdom of God back on earth. And if we leave it up to people, 
okay, like the Israelites, like David, like Saul, it's just going to fail. And people don't realize this. You know, a lot of Christians, I even get asked by Christians, you know, why, why, did, why did the Messiah have to be God as man? You know, why, did, why do we have to have the incarnation? It's because the covenants were made with people. And people fail, mm -hmm. always. <laughs> okay? mm -hmm. But God can't cheat. He can't look at the situation and say, well, that was a bad idea to make covenants with people. Because then it's like, well, God, shouldn't you have known that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. You know, it, it, he can't just say, well, you know, let's just forget that. Let's just call it good and you know, let's do something else. You can't do that. So the solution is, since the covenants were made with people, and God is the only one who can keep his own covenants, he says, I have to become a man. I will become a man, fulfill my own covenants, and die in their place. So the incarnation is really, really important for reasons that you, you wouldn't normally suspect, but it's tied to the failure of humanity, even of the Davidic line. Hmm. But since he makes the covenant with David, I not only have to become a man, I gotta be of the line of David, I gotta you know, got fulfill all these things. Hmm. And this becomes again, the, the stopgap measure. The kingdom of God is never gonna get kickstarted again unless God does it. And God comes as a man and does it. And this is why we have the inauguration, the kingdom language early, even before the crucifixion, you start to get kingdom language. Uh, the kingdom of God is here, it's present, it's going to start, you know, he dies, rises again, you know, sends the spirit, the spirit, you know, who is the Lord, he is, is but isn't Jesus, you know, all mm -hmm. that kind of talk in the New Testament. And from that point on, it's a progressive rolling back, it's a progressive recovering, you know, okay, reversing of depravity, of, of all mm -hmm. this bad stuff, Genesis 3 and Genesis 6 combined, hmm. that has happened, and even Genesis 11 with Babel, bringing the nations back into the fold. The Messiah is, is the key point person to do all of those things, all three of them, not just again, like Christians typically think, it's just about the fall and the resurrection. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's crucial. You can't have any of it without mm -hmm. it. But there's actually more going on here. The New Testament writers have more in their head than just this one passage. They have some of these other things too. Is this why the Lord chose Mount Hermon for the transfiguration? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a real slap in the face. <laughs> I, I, I do, you know, I discuss this in Unseen Realm too, so this, this one may be familiar again to some readers, mm -hmm. but Jesus goes into the territory of Bashan, okay, which again is associated with the giants in, in the Old Testament. That's where the conquest actually begins. Mm -hmm. The conquest begins and ends mm -hmm. with, with the defeat of the giants. People don't often realize that, but it's Bashan with Sion and Og early, and then Joshua defines victory in Joshua 11 as there's no more Adam Keem in the land. You know, hooray, you know, we win. So it, it's just this start to finish kind of thing, but Jesus goes into the same places that have all this baggage, this, this backstory yeah. to them. And you know, he, this is where we have in Bashan, we have the, you know, thou art Peter and upon this rock passage. And, and, and the rock of course is, is right there at the foot of Bashan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the cult of Dan, cult of Baal in the Old Testament, Mount Hermon is right there. At the Grotto of Pan. Right? Yes. Grotto, it, it, I mean, this is, this is spiritual warfare kind of at its best here. You know? So you, you go and you, and you, you essentially say, you, you, you poke Satan in the eye because he's the big Baal figure. Canaanite, Baal Zabul, mm -hmm. Baal Zabul in, in mm -hmm. the Gospels, yeah. the same Baal the guy, Prince, right. right. Yes. So he, he does that. And then they, they turn and six days later, they go up into the mountain. Well, there's only one mountain there and it's Hermon. And, and that's where the transfiguration happens. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm here, you know, <laughs> like do something about it. And, and my view is that Jesus does these things to pick a fight hmm. because he knows you know, right after he does this, he, he, the gospels say that from this point on, he began to teach his disciples that he needed to go to Jerusalem and die. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what? <laughs> like this was so much fun, you know, picking on Satan, then we get to pick on the watch. Casting out and, demons. Right. Yeah, this, is, this is awesome. You know, what are you talking about dying for? You know, but, but he picks the fight because he knows that's what needs to happen. And the forces of darkness don't. I mean, they know who he is. They know what the end game is. Well, you know, God wouldn't have sent his son unless he wanted to do this kingdom of God thing. You mm -hmm. know? And, and when you look at the Revelation 12 uh, incident that you mentioned earlier, it, yeah. th there was that fight in mm -hmm. heaven, yep. which... I mean, we can speculate because we don't know for sure, but uh, perhaps that was about let's let's see if we can stop this from happening. Yeah. Stop it! Stop it from happening. We don't want this kingdom of God talk anymore. And it, of course, he shows up. Mm -hmm. They know who he is, and I think Satan's offer is a genuine one. In other words, oh, I know why you're here. It's this kingdom of God business and reclaiming the nations and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, look, I can give you all that. Yeah. I got let's the keys. Shortcut the process. I can, right, I can I can deliver that for you if you'll just bow down and worship me. 
you know, it, it, again, it's just all this, this stuff that's under the surface, you mm -hmm. know, going on uh, that if you're familiar with your Old Testament and you haven't stripped the supernatural out of it, that, that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see, again, what, what the conversation is really about. And so, you know, he, he does this to pick the fight, and, and sure enough, a week later, triumphal entry, everybody's cheering, and a week after that, he's dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what needs to happen. You know, and to quote, he, you know, on the cross, Psalm 22, bulls of Bashan surround me. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus isn't talking about being surrounded by cattle. Okay, the, the bull was a, was a Baal symbol in Bashan, and so this is a demonic reference. Again, you miss a lot of these things if you don't, you know, have the ancient writer in your head. Mm. What's well, mm. funny is I, I, and I mentioned this over dinner last night, I recently read an academic paper called the Baals of Bashan, <laughs> in which a, a scholar went and made the case that Jesus couldn't have been referring to cattle on the cross or mm. uh, just poking fun at uh, uh, wealthy the people, women, yeah, wealthy the women, women of yeah, the cows <laughs> of Bashan. Bec and he, instead of looking at the, <laughs> the theological argument, he actually went back and examined soil samples and archeological <laughs> digs for pollen samples to prove that there were no cattle in Bashan because right. it was a lousy place for grazing. But the point was the same. Yeah. It was a theological point that Jesus was making. He was talking about the principalities and powers that uh, Paul wrote about, who were the ones that were surrounding him on the cross. Yep. But then, now was, it, uh, was it 1 Corinthians 6-2 where uh, Paul makes the further case that uh, they would not have crucified him if they really understood was, what they knew. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. 2, 6, yeah. I got it reversed. Yeah. yeah, had they known, they would never would have crucified the Lord of glory, had the rulers of this world known. Yeah. And, and again, it, it, I, I take Paul for what he says there, because, again, it, it's not enough to know who he is. You know, the demons say, you're the son of the Most High. And by the way, it's kind of curious. They're the only ones who call him that. Mm -hmm. You know, the God, because they know exactly who this is. And again, they know what the end game is. They know what the purpose is, but they don't know the mechanism. And, and they draw a logical conclusion. Well, you know, we tried to stop him and he's here. And, you know, well, let's just like, let's kill him. You know, problem solved. And, and of course, <laughs> that is not the problem solved. <laughs> That's exactly what we want you to do. Yes. Yeah. And again, it's this cat and mouse game that, you know, operates again under the surface. And Jesus, when he, when he knows it's time to die, it's like, okay, we go to Bashan now, and we pick a fight. And then we go to Herman, and we pick another one. And the Son of Man needs to die. Hmm. It's fascinating. The spiritual war, as recorded in the Bible, is far richer and more complex, more immediate and real than we ever imagined. The forthcoming book, Reversing Herman, Dr. Michael Heiser, the author. Mike, will continue the conversation. For Sharon Gilbert, I'm Derek Gilbert. And we thank you for watching as we keep watch. This is Skywatch TV. waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology. Conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. The non-canonical extra-biblical book of Enoch tells us that there were watchers, supernatural beings called the sons of God who came down on Mount Hermon, intermarried with humans, taught humanity things we should not know. That sin shows up in the New Testament. 
Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert, alongside my wife, best friend, the host of Skywatch Women, Sharon Gilbert. Hey, sweetie. And the author of a forthcoming book that deals with the sin of the Watchers and its importance for New Testament theology. He's the scholar in residence for Logos Bible Software, working title of the book, Reversing Herman, The Importance of the Sin of the Watchers. ...of what the Watchers did in terms of their teaching, their corruption, is what becomes the central focus for the proliferation of evil. Remember Genesis 6, 5, okay, or after the, you know, the whole Sons of God episode, right. that describes just the all-encompassing wickedness, okay, of, of humanity. Well, you ask, well, how did they be get, get that wicked? Because you kind of go from the Genesis 6 stuff and the, you know, the Sons of God, the Nephilim and all that, and then you get to this statement about wickedness. Again, that question is answered in both the New Testament and, of course, in the intertestamental period. Because if you asked a Jew, again, to, to explain his hamartiology, okay, his doctrine of sin, you know, why is the world the way it is and why, why, why do we have depravity? Their answer is not just ex, or Genesis 3, the fall, which is what our reflexive mm -hmm. response would be. Their answer is, well, the watchers, Genesis 6. Okay, what they taught people corrupted them, and, and it just spread like wildfire or wildfire through humanity. And so that is the thing that in the Jewish mind, that's the human problem. We are doomed you know, to an eternity without God because we, we, we won't be resurrected unless, again, we're redeemed. Okay, because of what happens in Genesis 3, you know, we're sort of owned by the Lord of the dead, you know, the Satan figure and all this kind of stuff. It's very familiar in Christian theology. But not only that, not only does that need to be dealt with and reversed, but depravity needs to be dealt with and reversed. Hmm. And so for the, for the Jew, when they thought about Messiah, when they thought about what the Messiah was supposed to do, it wasn't just resurrection, cure my, cure my death problem. It was cure my depravity problem, fix the world. Hey, while you're at it, you know, while you're rising, rising from the dead, why don't you fix the world too? And so this, they had the whole complex of ideas in view, and it's because of the Watcher incident. Hmm. Hmm. So this is more than just a complicating the, the matter from the fall, mm -hmm. from Genesis 3. Uh, it, it, we, we've begun to sin humanity mm -hmm. because of the... Uh, Adam and Eve were lured into the, the lie of right. the, the Nakash into they believing they could be capable, as gods. Right. They were capable of sinning because they do, again, in the biblical story, but they become better at it. They become more inclined to it. They, they, they discover new ways, you know, to, to serve themselves, mm -hmm. okay, hmm. because of, of, you know, what the more watchers do. More secret knowledge stuff. Yeah. So, so again, this is part of, again, the, the Jewish view of, of why the world is the way it is. Now, I'll, I'll give you a few hints, you know, without, you know, too many spoilers here for the book. No, but, we want spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm going to say, and what I write in the book, I, and I tell people in the book, look, a lot of this is going to be really unfamiliar to you. For, for the academic, again, for the biblical scholar, scholars write about this stuff all the time. I mean, there, there are just mounds and mounds and mounds of journal articles in the book of Enoch for New Testament theology, the subtitle, Dr. Michael Heiser. Mike, welcome back. Thank you. Um, for those of us who were raised in church every Sunday morning, um, you know, Sunday school, since I can remember all mm -hmm. the way through college, at which time I kind of fell away. Um, Mount Herman, never mentioned. <laughs> Watchers never Gee, mentioned. it was in my church. It, yes, <laughs> even, even though, there. <laughs> yeah, even though, even though, you know, the Watchers are mentioned in the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, never heard that term, never heard any of this stuff. Um, where do we find the sin of the Watchers? And, and maybe as a, a review, what is the sin of the Watchers? And then how does that affect and influence New Testament theology? Sure. Yeah, the, the sin of the Watchers, again, the, the sort of the quick version of it is, not only the transgression, you know, transgressing heaven and earth, this boundary, the, the first estate, you know, to use Peter and Jude language. That's what people typically think of, but it's, it's actually more than that. It's a part of that, you know, era that's presented in, in this book involved the watchers teaching people, you know, for lack of a better term, forbidden arts, forbidden knowledge, things that, that corrupted humanity, warfare, mm -hmm. okay, arts of seduction, you know, just things like this. And so, in, in, in the Jewish mind, again, in the intertestamental period, which is where we get you know, the book we know as Enoch and other books that are Enochian, as scholars like to refer to them, this notion, you know, scholars typically just write for themselves about Enoch and Enochian story and the sin of the watchers in the New Testament. This is, this is a, a kind of a snoozer, okay? It's, it's old stuff. But nobody's ever collected it 
and put it into a book form and try to make it decipherable again to the normal person, you know, the person who's just interested in Bible study. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you get the birth of the Messiah. Now, this ties in again with, if, if you actually take Revelation 12, okay, as the, a, an example of the ancient genre of astral prophecy, that what John sees in the sky, he actually means when he says, I see these things in the sky, you know, and they portend the birth of the Messiah. Again, you, and people beside me have done this. They plotted this out in astronomy programs, and it produces a date, you know, for the birth of, of the Messiah, September, mm -hmm. you know, 11th, 3 B.C. Mm -hmm. Which that. is creepy in and of yes, itself, it September 11th, of itself, yeah. Right. But that correlates with Tishri 1. Okay, mm -hmm. It was the same day in the Jewish calendar. Tishri 1 is the inauguration of the Jewish king, you know, in, in Israelite times and all ah. this stuff. But there's like more, the same as Rosh Hashanah? Yes. There, there, there's more to it than that because... In Jewish tradition, and again, the book deals with why Jews thought this, and it's based on flood chronology. There we are back now to the Genesis 6, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. In their view, Noah was also born on Tishri 1. And so the Messiah uh, and Noah would have shared yes. a...